This is the headland of sea-washed Lemnos, land untrodden by men and desolate. It was here, child bred of man, who was the noblest of the Greeks, Neoptolemus, son of Achilles, that I exposed long ago, the native of Manus, Poyer's son, on the express command of the two chieftains to do so, because his foot was all running with a gnawing disease. Neither libation nor burnt sacrifice could be attempted by us in peace, but with his wild, ill omen cries, he fills the whole camp continually with shrieking, moaning. But what need is there to speak of that? The time is not ripe for too many words, lest he even learn that I am here, and I so waste the whole ruse whereby I think soon to take him. Come. It's your task to serve as my ally in what remains, and to seek where in this region there is a cave with two mouths. During cold weather, it provides two seats facing the sun, while in the summer, a breeze wafts sleep through the tunneled chamber, and a little bellow on the left hand. Perhaps you will see water rising from a spring, if it has not failed. Go there silently and signal to me whether he still dwells in this same place or is to be found elsewhere, so that the rest of my plan may be explained by me, heard by you, and sped by the joint effort of us both. King Odysseus, the completion of the task that you sent me is not far off, for I believe I see a cave like that which you have described. Above you or below? I do not see it. Here, high up, and of footfalls there is not a sound. See that he is not sheltered there, asleep. I see an empty dwelling, without occupants. And is there no vision inside for human habitation? There is a bed of leaves, as if for someone who makes his lodging here. And all else is bare, there is nothing else beneath the roof. Just a cup of bare wood, the masterpiece of a sorry craftsman, and with it these tools for kindling. His is store that you describe. Ah, yes. And here besides are some rags drying in the sun, stained by some severe infection. The man inhabits these regions clearly, and is somewhere not far off. How could he go far afield with his foot is maimed by that old plague? No, he has gone out into food or of some spoon herb that he may have noted somewhere. Send your attendant, therefore, to keep watch, lest he come upon me unawares, since he would rather take me than all the Greeks together. The man is going, and the path will be watched. And now, if you need anything else, say so. Son. Achilles, you must be loyal to the goals of your mission, and not with your body alone. But you hear some new plan unknown to you, till now, you must serve it, since it is to serve that you are here. Then what are your orders? You must cheat the mind of Philostasis by means of a story told as you converse with him. When he asks you who and from where you are, say that you are the son of Achilles. It is not in that detail that you will cheat him, but tell him sailing homeward and have left the fleet of the Achaean warriors after coming to hate unbounded, uh, after coming to hate them with unbounded hatred. Give him this reason. When with no other hope of William, they had summoned you by their prayers to come from home, they judged you not worthy of the arms of Achilles, not worthy to receive them, even though they had come and were claiming them by right, but instead handed them over to Odysseus. Say what you would of me, even the vilest of vile insults, you will not harm me at all by that. But if you fail to do as I say, you will inflict pain on all the Argives. For if that man's bow is not seized, you can never lack, you can never sack the realm of Dar.
Danus, and learn why your intercourse with him may be free from mistrust and danger while mine cannot. You have sailed to Troy under no oath to any man nor under any constraint. Neither did you have any part in the early expedition. I, however, can deny none of those things. Accordingly, if he perceives me while he is still master of his bow, I am dead. Then you, as my comrade, will share my doom. No, the thing for which we must devise a ruse is just this. How you may steal his invincible weapons. Well, I know, my son, that by nature you are not apt to utter or contrive such treachery, yet knowing that victory is a sweet prize to gain, steal yourself to do it. Our honesty shall be displayed another time. Now, however, give yourself to me for one brief, shameless day, and then for the rest of time, may you be called the most righteous of all humankind. I abhor acting on advice, son of Laertes, which causes pain in the hearing. It is not in my nature to achieve anything by means of evil or cunning, nor was it, as I hear, in my father's. But I am ready to take the man by force and without treachery, since with the use of one foot only, he will not overcome so many of us in a struggle. And yet I was sent to assist you and am reluctant to be called traitor. Still, I prefer, my king, to fail when doing what is honourable than to be victorious in a dishonourable manner. Son of a father so noble, I too, in my youth, once had a slow tongue and an active hand. But now that I have come forth to test, I see that the tongue, not action, is what masters everything among men. What then are your orders, apart from my lying? I command you to take Philostasis by deceit. And why by deceit rather than by persuasion? He will never listen and by force you cannot take him. Has he strength so terrific to make him bold? Yes. Shafts inevitable, exports of death. Then one does not dare even approach him. No, unless he takes the man by deceit as I prescribe. Then you think it brings no shame to speak what is false? No, not if the falsehood yields deliverance. And with what expression on his face will anyone dare mouth those lies? When what you do promises gain, it is wrong to shrink back. And what gain is it for me that he should come to Troy? His arrows alone will capture Troy. Then am I not to be the conqueror, as you said? Neither will you be without them, nor they without you. It would seem, then, that we must track them down, if things stand as you say. No, that by doing this task, you win two rewards. What are they? If I knew, I would not refuse the deed. You will be celebrated in the same breath as clever and as noble. So be it. I will do it and cast off all shame. Do you remember then the story that I recommended? Be sure of it, since once and for all I have consented. You stay here then to wait for him. Meanwhile, I will go away so as not to be observed here with you and I will send our lookout back to your ship. And if at my view you seem to linger at all beyond the due time, I will send the same man back again after distinguishing him as the captain of the merchant ship so that the secrecy may be on our side. Then, son, as he tells his artful glory, take whatever in his tale is from time to time helpful to you. Now I will go to the ship. Matters here for you. May escorting Hermes, the deceiver, lead us on and divine victory, Athena, Leos, saves me always. Hello, and welcome to Reading Greek Tragedy Online. Uh, I'm Joel Christensen of Brandeis University, and I'm here with members of the Center for Hellenic Studies and the Cosmos Society, 
Uh, Norman Sandridge from Howard University is going to be joining us shortly. And we have uh, the actors you've just seen, um, Jack Whittam and Evelyn Miller, reading the parts of Odysseus and Neoptolemus, and soon to be joined by Tim Delap and Paul O'Mahony. The second play that we're reading um, during our own time of isolation is the is Philoctetes by Sophocles. It was performed originally in 409 BCE, and it won first prize that year. Um, it came at a time when Athens was entering, entering its third decade of what now is known as a Peloponnesian War. Um, and the basic background is that this character, Philoctetes, was bitten on the foot uh, by a snake years before when they were starting the war at Troy and was abandoned on an island. Um, years later, they found out that they could not take Troy without his sacred weapon that once belonged to Heracles. So the basic quest of the story, the myth, is that these two figures, Neoptolemus and Odysseus, have to go to Lemnos and bring Philoctetes back to Troy to use his bow to help end the war. But the man who does this is Odysseus. And the story that Sophocles tells is not one just about ending a war, but it's about what you need to say to create a community of a different kind. And that's why Norman Sandridge is joining us today um, from Howard to talk to us about the politics of this play, more of the background and some of the themes that drive it. Norman? All right, excellent. Thank you, uh, Joel. And uh, it's a really uh, great pleasure to be with everyone here uh, today. Uh, greetings from Silver Spring, Maryland, where uh, spring is in full bloom. So uh, our quarantine could be a lot worse. It ha happens to be a really uh, nice season uh, now. As Joel was saying, uh, this play was performed in 409 BCE, which of course is the, uh, the height of the Peloponnesian War. The war would be over uh, in about four more, uh, five more years, but of course no one knew that at the time. Uh, and I, I think uh, for me, the, the best place to, to sort of understand the themes of the play is to begin with the name Philoctetes. Uh, it seems to be made up of two Greek stems. Uh, one is philos and the other is ktema. Philos uh, means a dear one, dear or a friend, and ktema means uh, a possession, uh, an object. And so the name Philoctetes means something like he who is more dear than a possession. And if you ask most people, are human beings more dear than possessions? I would hope most would say yes, uh, unless they were psychopathic. Uh, but what uh, Sophocles is, is exploring here, I think, are the circumstances in which someone might actually uh, come to regard another human being as less uh, valuable than a possession, uh, or might even regard them as a possession themselves to be uh, cast out or disregarded um, in, in that way. And as I say, I think Sophocles is exploring uh, what are the conditions under which this might happen? Uh, and obviously this is, display is happening in wartime. Uh, it's also happening uh, at a time in Athens when uh, rhetoric and philosophy and philosophical training are kind of at their height. Uh, so the philosopher so Socrates is uh, at this time engaging in the very behavior that would later uh, be Part of the charge that he was uh, corrupting the youth uh, that would later, uh, you know, for, uh, cause him to be uh, executed. So, uh, as I say, Sophocles is interested in uh, kind of what are the rhetorical conditions, the political conditions, philosophical conditions that might uh, cause someone to devalue another human being. Uh, this is also the the height of Athenian democracy, uh, which we call radical democracy or direct democracy when uh, groups of people can make, uh, large groups of people can make spontaneous decisions for, um, for better or ill, uh, just on, on a moment's notice. So, uh, you know, that, that's why you see uh, uh, Odysseus here having such a strong influence on Neoptolemus because he's a master of rhetoric and he's able to elicit 
uh, Neoptolemus's uh, own worst impulses uh, in, in what we might call a theme of anti-mentorship, which I, I find really fascinating uh, as well, both in, in ancient Greek literature and in modern context. And I'll, I'll wrap it up there and just say uh, that if you're looking, uh, we're all in some form of quarantine these days, and if you're looking for a great comparanda to this play, uh, you could do no worse or uh, maybe no better. Uh, you could do worse, but maybe no better than uh, taking a look at two of my favorite movies from the 80s, and that would be uh, Oliver North's Wall Street with um, Michael Douglas and uh, Charlie Sheen in the respective roles of Odysseus and Neoptolemus, or another movie from the 80s, Martin Scorsese's The Color of Money with a middle-aged um, Paul Newman and a very young Tom Cruise in a similar role. So I'll, I'll leave it uh, there and we'll come back to these themes hopefully later. Thanks, Norman. Um, it's really good to see your face and hear your voice along with everybody else here. Um, I want to introduce now formally Paulo Mahoney of the Out of Chaos Theater Group. Um, he is the mind behind our shared madness here. He's brought the actors together. He's brought us together, Center for Atlantic Studies, and he'll take us to the next scene. Paul? Thanks, Joel. Um, yes, so we've uh, we've already seen then the the opening scene of the play. We've seen um, Odysseus give Neoptolemus uh, all the info that he thinks he needs, um, and uh, setting him up for when he encounters Philoctetes for the first time. And now we're going to see that we're going to see the arrival of Philoctetes, um, and that the first scene that he plays out with Neoptolemus. Oh, strangers. Who can you be? And from what country that you have put into this harbourless and desolate land? What would I rightly say is your city or your ancestry? The fashion of your equipment is Greek and most welcome to my sight. But it would please me to hear your voices. And do not shrink from me in fear or be frightened by my savage looks. No pity. No oh, pity, one so wretched and so lonely, a castaway, so friendless and so miserable. Speak to me, if indeed you have come as friends. Oh, answer. It is not right that I be disappointed by you in this request, at least, nor you by me. Well, know first, stranger, that we are Greeks, since you desire to learn this. Oh, cherished sound. Ah, that I should truly be greeted by such a man after so long a time. What need, young man, has made you land here and brought you to this spot? What business? What wind so kind? Speak, tell me all, so that I may know who you are. My birthplace is the island Skiros, and I am sailing homeward. I am the son of Achilles, by name Neoptolemus. Now you know everything. O oh, son of a father I loved and of soil I cherished. Ward of aged Lycomedes, on what mission have you touched this shore? From where are you sailing? Well, since you ask, it is from Ilium that I am now guiding my ship. What? You were certainly not our shipmate at the beginning of the expedition there. And did you have a part in that toil? Then you do not know who I am. How should I know one whom I have never seen before? Then you have not even heard my name or any rumour of those sufferings under which I have been perishing. Be sure that I know nothing of what you ask. How cursed I must be. How abhorred by the gods, if not a word of my miserable condition has reached my homeland, or any Greek land at all. Instead, those men who against the gods' law cast me away, keep their secret and laugh while my plague has ever flourished and grows worse. O oh, my son, boy, whose father was Achilles, here I am before you, the man of whom you have perhaps heard as Lord of the Bow of Hercules, Philoctetes, the son of Paeus. I am he, the two marshals and the Cephalian king, shamelessly hurled to this solitude which you see when I was wasting with a fierce disease, stricken by the savage bite of the murderous serpent. With that plague for my sole companion, boy, those men put me out here alone and left after they landed here with their fleet from sea-washed Christ. Delighted they were then, when they saw me asleep after much tossing on the waves in the shelter of a cave upon the shore, and they abandoned me. 
first, setting out a few rags as though for an unfortunate beggar, and a bit of food too, a small work of charity. But may they get what they gave me. Can you imagine, boy, what kind of awakening I had when they had gone and I rose from sleep that day? What stinging tears I wept, and what miseries I bewailed when I saw that the ships with which I had sailed were all gone, and that there was no man in the place, not one, to help me. Not one to ease the sickness that afflicted me. When looking all around me, I could find nothing at hand save agony, but of that a ready store. So time passed for me, season by season, and alone in this narrow house, I had to attend to all my wants by my own resources. For my stomach's needs, this bow provided, bringing down doves on the wing, and whatever my string spared arrow might strike. In pain, I would crawl to it myself, dragging my wretched foot behind me. Or again, if water had to be fetched, or if when the frost had spread, as often happens in winter, a bit of fire would have to be broken, I would creep out in pain and manage it. Then fire would be lacking, but by rubbing stone hard on stone, I would at least at last reveal the hidden spark which preserves me from day to day. Indeed, a roof over my head and a fire inside provides all that I want, except release from my disease. Come now, son, you must understand what sort of island this is. No mariner approaches it by choice, since there is no anchorage or port where he can find a gainful market or a kindly host. This is not a place to which prudent men voyage. But suppose that someone has put in against his will, for such things may often happen in the long course of a man's life. These visitors then, when they come, son, have compassionate words for me. And perhaps moved by pity, they give me a little food or some clothing. But there is one thing that no one will do. Whenever I mention it, take me home in safety. No, this is already the tenth year that I am wasted by misery from hunger and suffering, by feeding this gluttonous plague. This is what the Atreids and the forceful Odysseus have done to me. May the gods on Olympus someday give them agonies as strong and requital for mine. I believe that I, too, pity you, son of Poet, as much as your former visitors. And I myself attest your accusations, for I know their truth through my own experience with the wickedness of the Atreids and the force of Odysseus. What, do you also have a grievance against the accursed son of Atreus? A cause for anger at some mistreatment? If only I might one day be allowed to fulfil my heart's rage by the deeds of my hand, so that Mycenae might learn, and Sparta, that Skiros is also a mother of brave men. Well said, son. Now what is the reason that you have come complaining against them with this fierce wrath? I will tell you. And yet it is hard to tell. The outrage that I suffered from them upon my arrival here. For when fate decreed that Achilles should die... Ah me, tell me no more until I first know this. Is the son of Peleus dead? Dead. Not by a mortal hand, but by a god's. He was brought down, as men say, by the hour of Phoebus. Well, noble alike are the slayer and the slain. But I am at a loss to know, son, whether I should first inquire into the wrong done to you, or mourn the dead. Your own sorrows, I think, are enough for you, unhappy man, without mourning those of your neighbour. You speak the truth. Therefore, tell me again what happened to you, and how they wronged you. They came for me in a ship, elaborately ornamented, shining Odysseus, and he who fostered my father, and said, whether truly or falsely I do not know, that since my father had perished, fate now forbade that anyone but I should take the... Towers of Troy. Saying this, saying that this, my friend, was how things stood, they caused me no long delay before I set sail in haste, chiefly because of my yearning for the dead, that I might look upon him before burial, since I had never seen him. Then, besides, theirs was a fine promise, if by accompanying them I might sack the towers of Troy. 
It was now the second day of my voyage when, sped by breeze and all, I approached bitter Sigeum. When I landed, straight away the entire army thronged me around me with greetings, vowing that they saw their lost Achilles once more alive. He, though, lay ready for burial, and I, unhappy when I had wept for him, went before long to the Atriids, to friends, as it was reasonable to suppose, and claimed my father's arms and all else that had been his. Oh, their reply was bold and shameless. Seed of Achilles, you may take all else that was your father's, but these arms, another man now is lord, the son of Laertes. The tears came quick to my eyes as I sprung up in passionate anger and said in my bitterness, madman, have you dared give my arms to another man in my place without asking me? But Odysseus, for he chanced to be at hand, said, yes, boy, they awarded them as was just, since it was I that saved the arms and their master by my presence in the crucial moment. Then, immediately in my fury, I began to lash at him with every kind of insult, and left not one unsaid, as if he was indeed to rob me of my arms. At this point, stung by the abuse, though not given to anger, he answered, You have not gone to where we have. Instead, you have been absent from where you were needed. And since your tongue is so arrogant, you will never sail back to Skiros with those arms in your possession. In that way rebuked, in that way insulted, I sail home, deprived of what is my own by that worst offspring of a wicked line, Odysseus. And yet I do not blame him as much as I do those in power. For a city hangs wholly on its leaders, and so does an army. But when men shatter law in order, it is the lessons of their teachers that corrupt them. My tale is told in full. May he who hates the Atreids be as dear to the gods as he is to me. After saying those lines, the conversation continues between Neoptolemus and Philoctetes, and they go over some of the events that happened to Troy and the records of the heroes who were there, um, and they dance around the identity of Odysseus. Uh, Neoptolemus steers him away, and eventually Neoptolemus promises to take Philoctetes home, um, and that's where we find ourselves at the beginning of the next scene, when Philoctetes gets to, uh, or has a soliloquy of his own about his experience. Now by your father and by your mother, son, by all that you cherish at home, I solemnly supplicate you, do not leave me alone like this, helpless amid these miseries in which I live, so harsh as you see and so numerous as I have said. Consider me a small side task. Great is your disgust, well I know, at such a cargo, yet bear with it all the same. To noble minds, baseness is hateful and a good deed is glorious. If you forsake this task, you will have a stain on your honour. But if you perform it, boy, you will win the prize of highest honour if I return alive to Eta's soil. Come, the trouble will not last one full day. Endure it. Take me and throw me where you will, in the hold, the prow, the stern, wherever I will least annoy my shipmates. Say yes, by the great God of suppliant son, be persuaded. I supplicate you at your knees. I am an infirm wretch and lame. Do not leave me desolate like this. Far from the paths of mankind. No, bring me safely to your home or to Aeobia Chalcodon's seat. And from there, it will be no long journey for me to Eta and the Trachinian Heights and fair flowing Spercius, so that you may show me to my beloved father. Though long I have feared that he may have departed me for often, did I summon him by means of those who came here sending imploring prayers that he would himself send a ship and get me safely home? But either he is dead or else, as I think is likely, my messengers thought my concerns of little account and hurried on their homeward voyage. Now, however, since in you I have found one who can be both an escort and a messenger, save me 
and show me mercy, keeping in mind that all human destiny is full of the fear and the danger that prosperity may be followed by its opposite. He who stands clear of trouble must beware of dangers. And when a man leaves at ease, then it is that he must look most closely to his livelihood, lest it secretly suffer ruin. With that reference to his livelihood, um, we get uh, the audience gets a focus again on what's about to happen next, which is thoughts about this magical bow that they need to take back to Troy. The ensuing scene moves them towards a moment where there is a an issue. What is what an issue at the play comes to the fore, and that's how are they going to get the bow, and will they steal it from him? In the meantime. Uh, Neoptolemus continues to spin the lie that he's telling about his breakaway with the story, uh, sorry, his breakaway from the Atriots, from Menelaus and Agamemnon, and how much he dislikes Odysseus. A merchant comes on stage and gives him more of a background story. He tells him that Diomedes and Odysseus are sailing from Troy to retrieve him and to get the bow. And what this does is it creates this opposition. It puts Neoptolemus on Philoctetes' side and he gets to start asking him that most instrument of questions, where did you put your bow? And that's the scene that we come to next. Please, come on. Why so silent with no apparent cause? And why are you paralyzed? Aye, aye. What is the matter? Nothing serious, go on, son. Are you in pain from the disease that frequents you? No, indeed, no. I, I think it is better now. Gods, oh. Why do you groan like this and call on the gods? That they may come to me with power to save and soothe. I. What I. troubles you? Speak, do not keep so silent. It is plain enough that you are suffering somehow. I am destroyed, boy. I can never conceal my suffering when you are close. Ah. It shoots through me, shoots straight through. Oh, the pain, the misery. I am destroyed, boy, I am devoured. Ah, by the gods, I beg you, if you have a sword ready to hand, strike at my ankle, cut it off now, do not spare my life. Quick, boy, quick. What new thing has come on you so suddenly that you wail for yourself with these loud shrieks? You know, son. What is it? You know, boy. What ails you? I do not know. How could you not know? Uh oh. Oh. Yes, terrible is the burden of your disease. Terrible beyond telling, oh, pity me. What should I do? Do not betray me because of fear. This plague comes only now and then, perhaps when she has been sated with her roamings elsewhere. Oh, poor wretch, poor man, truly, for all your sufferings. Shall I support you or somehow offer a helping hand? No, no, but take this bow of mine as you early asked of me, and keep it in your care and safe until this present bout with my disease is past. For indeed, sleep takes me as soon as this pain passes away, nor can it cease before then. But you must allow me to sleep in peace. And if those men come in the meantime, then by the gods I forbid you willingly or unwillingly or by any skilled trickery to give up this bow to them, lest you bring destruction at once on yourself and on me who am your supplement, suppliant fears as to my caution. The bow shall pass into no hands but yours and mine. Give it to me, and may good luck accompany it. There, take it, boy. And humble yourself before the jealous gods, so that the bow may not prove baneful for you as it did for me, and for him who owned it before me. O oh gods, grant this to the two of us and grant us a voyage prosperous and unimpeded to whatever goal the god may deem right and that our mission provides. Futile, I fear, are your prayers, boy. Look, once again, the dark blood is oozing drop by drop from deep in the wound, and I look for worse to come. Ah, me, oh, cursed foot, what torment you cause me. It creeps on me, it is coming near, ah, misery. Now you know my condition, do not flee, no. Oh, alas, Odysseus of Cephaline, once my friend, would that this anguish might stick to you and pierce your chest, ah, me. Oh, you twin marshals, Agamemnon and you Menelaus, may your flesh instead of mine nourish this plague and for as long, oh, ah, me, oh, death, 
death, though I am always summoning you day after day, why do you never come? O oh, son, noble youth, seize me, burn me up, true friend, in that fire feigned as Lemnian. I too once deemed it lawful to do that very service for the son of Zeus, in return for which I received these same arms which are now in your keeping. What do you say, boy, what do you say? Why this silence? What are your thoughts, son? My heart has long been aching for your load of pain. Stop then and take courage. This visitor comes sharply but goes quickly. Yet I beg you, do not leave me alone. Take heart, we will remain. Will you? Be sure of it. Indeed, I do not think it right to put you under oath. Rest assured, it is not lawful for me to leave without you. Give me your hand in pledge. I give it. To stay. Now take me there, over there. What do you mean? Up there. What is this new delirium? Why do you gaze at the dome above us? Let me go, let me go. Where will you go if I do so? Let me go, I say. I will not. You will kill me if you touch me further. There, then, I release you. If in fact you believe it is for the better. Wide earth, embrace me now on the verge of death. This pain no longer lets me stand up. Sleep, I think, will take him before long. See, his head sinks backwards. Yet a sweat runs over his whole body and a dark hemorrhaging vein has burst from his heel. Come, friends, let us leave him in quietness so that he may fall asleep. At this moment in the play, Neoptolemus has gained that object for which he sailed from Troy. He has the bow in his hands. And when Philoctetes awakes, when they meet again, he suddenly realizes that he has lost the thing that's most valuable and he's worried Neoptolemus won't give it back and Neoptolemus says he can't give it back. And suddenly Philoctetes starts to realize that there's something more going on and he accuses um, Neoptolemus of lying to him and they go back and forth and the one man to come in to make everything worse is Odysseus. Odysseus comes on stage and he speaks calmly about everything and he says uh, revealingly what kind of a what kind of a man the time the circumstances demand that's the kind of man I am and he pushes both Neoptolemus and Philoctetes into their own corners as they argue more and they come to this sort of worst of all possible options which is that they'll steal the bow and leave Philoctetes. And Neoptolemus is between the oaths he's made to, made to Philoctetes and the oaths he's made to the state. And that's where we are in the scene that starts around line 1200 with Neoptolemus, Philoctetes, Odysseus, the chorus, and Heracles. Will you not tell me why you make this return journey with such eager speed? I come to undo the mistake that I made earlier. Your words alarm me. What mistake was that? The one I made when I obeyed you and all the army. What did you do that was unworthy of you? I captured a man by disgraceful deceits and treachery. What man? Can you be planning something rash? Rash, no. But to Poas's son. What are you going to do? Hmm? Suddenly, a certain fear comes over me. From whom I took this bow back to him. Zeus, what will he say? Certainly you do not intend to give it back. Yes, I do. Because disgracefully and unjustly, I got hold of it. In the name of the gods, are you saying this to mock me? If it is mockery to speak the truth. What do you mean, Neoptolemus? What, what are you saying? Must I repeat the same words twice and three times? I would not have wished to hear them even once. Know for certain that I have nothing more to say. There is someone, I tell you, who will prevent your deed. What do you mean? Who will oppose me in this? The whole host. Of the Achaeans, and I for one. Wise though you were born, your threats are void of wisdom. And your words are not wise, nor is that which you want to do. And yet, if they are just, they are better than wise. And how is it just for you to give up what was won by means of my plans? 
my error was to my dishonour, and now I must try to retrieve it. The army of the Achaeans causes you no fear when you do this? With justice on my side, I do not tremble at the terrors you name. No, not even at the threat of your hand do I yield obedience. Then our battles shall not be with the Trojans, but with you. So be it, if that is what the future holds. Do you see my right hand clasping my sword hilt? You will see me do the same, and not slowly. However, I will let you be. But I will go report this to all the army, and by them you will be punished. You have come to your senses, and if you are so prudent hereafter, perhaps you may steer clear of trouble. Odysseus feigns departure but conceals himself nearby. But you, son of Poas, come out, leave the shelter of your rocky home. What is this disruptive cry once more rising beside my cave? Why do you call me? What do you want of me? Oh no, this business will bring me no good. Have you come bringing, bringing me new misery on top of the old? Take heart and listen to my words. I'm afraid. Beautiful words did me evil once before when I believed your promises. Is there no room then for repentance? You spoke just like this when you were seeking to steal my bow. A professed friend with my destruction in his treacherous heart. I assure you, I am not so now. I merely wish to know whether you have resolved to stay here and endure or to sail with us. Stop, not another word. Whatever you may say will be said in vain. You are so resolved. More firmly believe me than words can say. Well, I could have wished that you had listened to my words. But if nothing that I say will help, then I am finished. Yes. All your pleas will be in vain. You will never again my mind's good will. You will never gain my mind's good will, since first you fraudulently seized my means of life and robbed me of it. And then you have come here to admonish me, you most hateful descendant of so noble a father. Ruin sees you all, the Atreids first, and next the son of De Laertes and you. Speak no more curses, and instead receive these weapons from my hand. What did you say? Am I being tricked a second time? No, I swear it by the pure majesty of Zeus Most High. Oh, welcome words, if your words are true. The deed will soon make it plain. Come, stretch your right hand and be master of your bow. But I forbid it, as the gods are my witnesses in the name of the Atriads and the entire army. Son, whose voice was that? Do I hear Odysseus? Be sure of it. And you see him at your side, who will carry you to the plains of Troy by force, whether or not the son of Achilles is willing. But it will bring you no joy if this arrow flies straight. Odysseus... Wait, by the gods, no, do not let it fly. Let go of me in the name of God, the gods, dear boy. I will not. Alas, why did you take from me the chance to kill my hated enemy with my bow? It would have been honourable neither for me nor for you. Well, you may be sure of one thing at least. The army's chiefs, the lying heralds of the Greeks, though bold with words, are cowards in the fight. Good. The bow is yours, and you have no cause for anger or complaint against me. Agreed. You have revealed the true stock, my son, from which you spring. You are no child of Sisyphus, but of Achilles, whose fame was the fairest when he was among the living, as it is now with the dead. I delight at your praise of my father and of myself. But hear what I desire to gain from you. It is true that men are compelled to bear the fortunes given by the gods, but when they cling to self-inflicted miseries as you do, no one can justly excuse or pity them. You have become savage. You welcome no counsellor, and if someone admonishes you, even if he speaks in all goodwill, you detest him and consider him an enemy who wishes you ill. All the same, I will speak to you, calling Zeus, who guards oaths to witnesses. And you remember these words and write them in your heart. 
you suffer this plague's affliction in accordance with God sent fate because you came near to Christie's guardian, the serpent who secretly watches over her home and guards her ruthless sanctuary. Know also that you will never gain relief from this grave sickness. As long as the sun still rises in the east and sets in the west until of your own free will, you come to the plains of Troy. Find there the sons of Escapulius, our comrades. Be relieved of this, of this infection and with this bow's aid and mine, be hailed as the sacker of Troy's towers. How I know these things are so ordained, I will tell you. We have a Trojan prisoner, Helenus, foremost amongst seers who sees plainly that all of this must come to pass and further that this very summer must see the complete capture of Troy. Otherwise, he willingly gives himself over for execution if these prophecies of his prove false. Therefore, now that you understand everything, give way graciously. It is a glorious addition to your game to be singled out as best of the Greeks, first for coming into healing hands and then for taking Troy, rich in tears and so winning a matchless renown. Hateful light. Why? Why do you keep me in the light of day instead of letting me go to Hades' domain? Ah me, what shall I do? How can I ignore this man's words when he has advised me with good will? But shall I yield then? How after doing that shall I, ill-fated, come into men's sight? Whom will I be able to talk to? You orbs that have watched my every suffering, how could you endure to see me consorting with the sons of Atreus who caused my ruin, or with the accursed son of Laertes? It is not my resentment for what has already been done that stings me. Rather, it is the many troubles which I seem to foresee I must suffer at the hands of these men in the future. For when the mind of men has once mothered wrongdoing, it trains those men to be wrongdoers in all else thereafter. And in you too, I wonder at this. You should never yourself revisit Troy and should prevent me from going there, seeing that those men have done you outrage by stripping you of your father's arms when in the suit for the weapons, they judged unhappy Ajax inferior to Odysseus. After that, will you go to fight at their side and compel me to do the same? No, do not do it, son. But as you swore to me, escort me home. You yourself remain in Skiros and leave those evil men to their evil doom. So shall you win double thanks from me as from your father. And you will not appear through your service to bad men to be like them in your nature. Your recommendation is reasonable. But nevertheless, I wish that you would put your trust in the gods and my words and sail from this land with me your friend. What? To the plains of Troy and to the abhorred son of Atreus with this miserable foot? No, rather to those who will free you and your pus-filled limb from pain and will save you from your sickness. You give her a frightening advice. What have you said? I recognise what will be best in the end for you and for me. Have you no shame before the gods for saying that? Why should a man be ashamed of benefiting his friend? Do you mean a benefit to the Atreids or for me? For you, certainly, since I am your friend and speak in friendship. How can that be when you would give me up to my enemies? Please, sir, learn to be less defiant in misfortune. You will ruin me, I know it, with these words. Not I, but you, I say, will not understand. Do I not know already that the Atreids cast me away? They cast you out, yes, but look if they will not turn to restore you. Never. If I must first consent to see Troy. What can I do, then, if my pleading fails to persuade you of anything that I recommend? The earliest course for me is to stop talking and for you to live, just as you do now, without deliverance. Let me bear the sufferings that have fated me. But what you promised me with your right hand in mine to bring me home, that promise fulfil for me, son. And do not delay or remind me further of Troy. I have had my fill of grief and lamentation. If it is your will, let us go. Oh, noble words. 
Now lean your steps firmly upon mine. As far as my strength allows. But how shall I escape blame from the Achaeans? Disregard it. What if they ravage my country? I will be there. What aid will you render? And with the shafts of Heracles. What? I will keep them away. Then say your farewell to this island and leave with me. Mm. Not yet. <laughs> Not until you have heard my commands, son of Poyas. Know that your ears perceive the voice of Heracles and that you look upon his face. For your sake, I've left my divine seat and come to reveal to you the purposes of Zeus and to halt the journey on which you are departing. Hearken to my words. First, I would tell you of my own fortunes, how by toiling through and enduring so many toils to the end, I have won the glory of deathlessness as you witness. And for you, be sure this fate is ordained, that through these toils of yours, you will make your life far famed. You shall go with this man to the Trojan city, where first you shall be healed of your cruel sickness, and then chosen out as foremost among the warriors in prowess with my bow, you shall sever Paris, the author of these evils, from life. You shall sack Troy and shall receive from the army the spoils of supreme valour to carry home to the heights of your native oiter for the delight of your father Poyas. And whatever spoils you receive from that army, from them carry to my pyre a thank offering for my bow. And these counsels hold for you also son of Achilles, for you have not the might to subdue the Trojan realm without him, nor he without you. Rather, like twin lions with the same quarry, each of you must guard the other's life. For the healing of your sickness, I will send Asclepius to Troy, since it is doomed to fall a second time before my arrows. But of this be mindful when you plunder the land, that you show reverence towards the gods, do this because Father Zeus regards all else as of less account, and because piety does not die along with mortals. Whether they are alive or dead, their piety does not perish. Ah, friend whose voice I have longed to hear, whose shape I see at long last, I will not disobey your commands. I too consent. Then do not long delay, for the occasion and the fair wind there at your stern urge you forward. Come then, let me hail this land as I depart. Farewell, chamber that shared my watches. Farewell, nymphs of stream and meadow, and you, strong pounding of the sea-lashed cape, where often in the cavern's inmost recess my head was wetted by the south wind's blasts, and where many times the Hermaean mount sent an echo to my sad groans in the gale of my sorrow. But now, clear springs and Lycian fount, I am leaving you, leaving you at last, though such a hope had never buoyed me. Farewell, sea-wrapped Lemnos, and send me off with sailing fair to my heart's content. Send me to the destination appointed me by mighty fate and the will of my friends, and by the all-taming God who has brought these things to pass. Now let us all live together. Once we have prayed to the nymphs of the sea, become be the guides of our safe return. There were some theatrical surprises in those performances that we didn't even know about. Um, the frame shifting was, was quite effective for Philoctetes and Neoptolemus. Um, I, I think there are some amazing things about this play that really help us think about our own circumstances. Um, obviously the ancient world is different. And one of the hard things about this play is that it does give us suffering and make us force us to think about the effects of isolation, but it also lets Philoctetes go home at the end, right? We know there's an end to this story. Um, our own stories are, uh, for lack of better word, uh, words uh, in process. 
Um, so I, I'd love to hear some more things about the performance choices, um, but I'd like to hear some more from Norman. Norman, I know you have lots of thoughts about this play. How did hearing the actors um, read these lines make you see more in it? Or how did it resonate with what you've already been thinking about and our current events? Yeah, so um, thank you. And thanks to all the performers. That was really uh, fantastic. And uh, as a as a very weak amateur actor in my own right, uh, I realized the challenges you had to overcome by performing in separate locations. And I really, uh, I applaud Evelyn and Tom for uh, your uh, staging move at the very end there. And it actually, uh, gives us an opportunity to say a little bit more about the word philos, that stem in the name Philoctetes, which uh, means, I, I said before, it can mean a friend uh, or a dear one, uh, but it also means a near one, that is to say someone in uh, real physical proximity. The word philos can also be uh, just a possessive adjective. If you want to say, this is my hand, you can say phile hair. Uh, the you know my 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 near my near hand or my my own hand and it's actually uh, the word philos is etymologically connected with uh, the Germanic ultimately the Germanic word by as in the phrase by the river or if I walk by the river it means uh, that you're near so I I thought uh, you guys uh, did an amazing job of capturing that uh, theme of friendship that is so important to the play. And, um, you know, it, 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 we can talk about this more, or think about this more. The, the word friend these days is so uh, loosely used. You hear people in Congress say, my friend on the other side, uh, you know, that's just a courtesy. Like the, these people almost never hang out with one another and they, you know, uh, their interests are not uh, usually that well aligned. And of course you can have uh, hundreds, if not thousands of friends in a social media context. But I, I think this word philos here, is, is, as I say, is worth thinking about a little bit more uh, because it really, uh, and, and, and you all brought this out really well, it, it really means like an alliance. Uh, it, it really means uh, you've got each other's back. And uh, the pronouncement that, that Paul gave in the role of Heracles at the end, I mean, he, he's putting a stamp on what you, you might call the, the heroic ideal in Greek mythology of two comrades, two friends, uh, marching off into battle, uh, having each other's backs, and ideally, you know, winning the battle together, winning glory together. Um, whereas we're, you know, when we do um, war films and epics, you know, it's, it's often the, the troop or the, you know, the dirty dozen, the, the collection of individuals. But for uh, Greek mythology, it's that pairing there. And just one last footnote on this, um, what, what Neoptolemus and Philoctetes are doing here in a way is a redemption on the story of Achilles and Patroclus, because it had been Achilles fantasy that he and Patroclus would take Troy together, his, his near and dear uh, comrade, that they would take it together. But of course, we know that was not meant to be. So um, gr just great job uh, capturing, as they say, that that idea of, uh, of friendship and, and nearness and dearness and alliance and having each other's back and, and all of that. I don't know how much you want me to say. I could do this for an hour at least. <laughs> um. One of the things I like about uh, the etymology of philos that I learned from Lenny Milner, and I think he cribs it from Amelie Ben Benice, um, is in Greek, it's something that's so close to you that you feel that it's part of yourself. So when you call someone a philos, like to lose them would be to lose a part of your own body. Right. So I think um, uh, Tim and Evelyn, that's why it was so powerful when they were separate and then you came together. Right, uh, because it sort of res it restored what had been lost in displacement. Um, so I'd love to hear more about the choices you you made today in some of the theatricality. Yeah. Uh, Jack, your your window looks like something from a Dutch master. The way you have the light there, I don't know if that's intentional. And Paul, mm -hmm. when you brought the light in, um, it was dramatic. Um, but maybe we could start talking about what you guys saw in the characters, because you just had the words and you had a short amount of time. Um, Jack, what did you see in Odysseus? What did you bring out uh, in him? 
Well, when Paul told me about this uh, project uh, about four hours ago, <laughs> I, um, I, I had a quick look through it. I, I, I must be honest, I didn't know uh, the, the play, um, the characters too well. I know, you know, I know them sort of of, of other stories possibly, but um, it, it was interesting what you, um, someone compared it to, uh, was it The Colour of Money and um, uh, the... Uh, was it, Wolf, was it Wolf of Wall Street? It wasn't Wolf of Wall Street, was it? Um, it was but, just uh, Wall Street. And I think, I think I said that Oliver North was the director, um, but it, Oliver Stone's Wall Street from the 80s. Right, yeah. Um, it was uh, reading through it. I mean, it's uh, from an acting point of view, when you, uh, you can read something on your own, but until you hear other people um, start seeing to talk, um, there's only so much you can do. So it was really interesting reading with uh, Evie. Um, and, and also over this medium, um, Odysseus, uh, a manipulator, I think. Um, it's fair to say that he was, um, he's, he has uh, the, the sort of vocal skills um, to, to be able to sort of push what he wants. Um, and also the fact that he's uh, a king. Um, and it's uh, it was it was interesting playing around with it. Um, this uh, this lighting, as as the sort of performances were were going on, um, it struck me about what what's interesting. This this little box here is is you know framing me, and this is what what people see when it's when it's done in this way. So you can play around with that sort of thing. When Tim and Evie got together, that was amazing. Uh, Paul created sort of a, a crazy shadow. And himself and I started wondering, oh, what if I did this? And sort of maybe I could just be a hand at the start, and uh, you know, and, and use things like that, which which would be interesting. But it really did. It worked. Um, I've never seen a play reading online like this, and it worked much better than I thought it would. <laughs> Tim and Evie, um, did you guys talk at all about your about playing the characters before this, or did you just say, hey, here's roughly what we're going to do, and then sort of think about the characters on your own? Yeah, I think we, 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 um, so Paul kind of gave us the, the directorial, uh, hint that, that maybe it would be fun to kind of come together at the end there. Um, and then, yeah, we, we sort of talked briefly about it before. Um, mm. and, uh, but it was, it, it, it worked really, it worked really, it, it was lovely actually. And suddenly being able to talk to each other mm. rather than, to the screen was was great. It suddenly really brought the the scene to life. Um, so that was, I, I wasn't sure how that little bit of stagecraft would work, but it worked really well. I think sneaking up on you. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's interesting as well. I think, uh, despite the fact that for the first for the first sections, I was you know still looking at Tim through a screen, the awareness of the proximity made it feel so different. It really did, the, the awareness that, and, and you know, maybe not dissimilar to the way that those first scenes would take place at a distance, you know, with the kind of fear of, of, of a final approach maybe, especially with, you know, with the injury and the smell. Um, <laughs> you no, know, those, those first interactions between them, you imagine might take place with, with, with some space between them. Um, well, I thought that was really what you just said about you feeling the space differently because you were still engaging with him. It's interesting because, you know, most of many of us now are in isolation, right? Mm. Um, but some of us are in isolation with more people than others. Um, even if you're in a building with other people and you can hear them, it's very different from being out on an island like Tom Hanks and Castaway talking to a, a volleyball. Um, <laughs> and so, I mean, how is this different from last week when you're really just trying to engage on the screen alone? Um, it felt it felt really different, definitely, um, incredibly different. Even I think even if we'd remained on separate screens, screens, it would have felt, um, you know, it becomes more than the screen and more the more than the computer. You're aware that physically there is someone close to you who's you know involved in the same thing and and experiencing the same story at the same time. Um, yeah, it, it it does feel very different. Paul, um, 
So you were the deus ex machina, as well as sort of the director um, of intervention uh, today. Can you talk a little bit more about what Philoctetes means to you as a play and how it really works for the moment for you? Um, well, I think you know, obviously some of the things that have been brought up about the fact that he is, he's in this forced isolation. Actually, one of the, one of the things that I'd, I'd forgotten about before rereading the play for this is how he has had other people visiting him or, or not visiting, but they just happen to have been passing by and they happen to sort of, you know, say that they might give him a few little bits to eat and have a little bit of a chat, but then he gets left again. And actually it kind of struck me how much, how much worse that is. I mean, to take your Tom Hanks um, cast, <laughs> cast away sort of uh, analogy, if, if sort of everyone was popping by every sort of, every kind of couple of months, but no one was taking him off the island then I think he'd be uh, losing it even more than, uh, than he did. And there's something, so I think there's something obviously very sort of resonant to now about the fact that, it, that he's there in isolation. And it struck me sort of as well how this, this medium kind of actually lends itself quite, quite nicely to that, that sense of um, people being isolated. And there was something for me thinking about, because actually for Odysseus, Odysseus doesn't know for sure whether Neoptolemus is going to do what he wants, right? There's got to be there's got to be some sort of jeopardy there. Like, is this going to go my way or not? So I think the fact that they are kind of kept separate, sort of necessarily by the fact that we're all in different places, um, I, I thought that kind of really sort of worked for it. And there was something about it. It almost kind of struck me listening to it this time and watching it. It was almost sort of imagining Philoctetes on this island kind of desperately sending out radio messages. And it's like, who's gonna pick it up? Who's gonna pick it up? Oh, and then someone picks it up and they get chatting and I get chatting to you for a while. And, oh, can I persuade you to come and help me out? They kind of felt sort of like an element of, of that sort of someone desperately sending out uh, messages that kind of felt like it, it sort of worked. And, and actually with the, with the deus ex machina at the end, what I kind of, um, with sort of, with my, with my uh, lovely lamp just there, um, but what I was um, sort of, what I would love to have been able to do was something like, um, you know, kind of come across as like interference. You know, like you, you're breaking through the message that's kind of going on. And actually, I'm interrupting this service to tell you this is what's going to happen at the end. That's kind of, I feel that would be a great effect for that, for that role. Um, I Personally, I wouldn't mind a deus dea or, de, you know, theoi ex machina right now. Um, yeah, I think we could all use a little divine help if it's out there. Um, but so uh, part of what's interesting though about Philoctetes is he's not just alone. He's alone because he has this disease, right? It's not contagious, so we don't have that element, but there's something about him. I mean, he, he's, he's disabled in a way, right? He's a disabled person um, and he's not useful to society except for this thing he possesses. Um, so some of the language of his suffering is interesting. Um, Norman, I know you, you've been thinking about this from political perspectives for a long time. Uh, some of the machinations that we get from Odysseus and the, the character of Neoptolemus. How do the readings and our current events, uh, how have they changed the way that you think about the play? Yeah, so um, maybe it's, it's good to start with a, just a brief bit of um, framework for talking about this. Um, I've done a fair amount of research the last few years on the phenomenon of dehumanization, which the short definition just means that you deny other people some element of their humanity, whether it's the way they process the world emotionally or experientially, or you deny that they have a certain agency to plan and carry out plans, uh, things like that. We, we think of you know large scale dehumanization like the uh, American institution of slavery or the Holocaust, but dehumanization turns out uh, is something that kind of happens uh, everywhere in you know banal and mundane ways uh, all of the time. Uh, you know, and to to bring it back to our present situation, we have politicians in the United States right now who are wondering out loud uh, how many old people we might need to sacrifice for the good of our economy. And that, that again is kind of, I think, some of this tension between what's more important, a friend, a philos, a near and dear one, or your possessions, right? Which the economy is kind of the, 
the catch-all um, phrase for or term for a lot of times. Uh, and so getting back to this idea of dehumanization, it turns out that there are five very uh, relevant uh, circumstances in which we dehumanize other people, or at least what we, our chances of dehumanizing somebody else uh, goes up. And uh, th these are both political and social factors. One of the most common is uh, if you're in possession of authority over someone, or if you have power over someone, you tend to dehumanize them. Uh, and we can, you know, it would be a longer conversation why that happens. Uh, if, if you have wronged someone, if you have uh, hurt someone, you will tend to dehumanize them. Uh, amazingly and sadly, if you have observed someone be wronged or harmed, uh, you will have a tendency to dehumanize them. And the last two, uh, if you regard someone as a member of an out group, if you regard them as an outsider as opposed to being a member of an in group, um, you, you tend to dehumanize them. And finally, if you regard someone as physically or morally uh, disgusting, uh, you will tend to dehumanize. So, so Philoctetes has all of that going against him uh, in this play. People have harmed him. People have observed the harm that others have done to him. People hold power over him. He is disgusting, and he has been regarded as a member uh, of an outgroup. But I think amazingly, and this gets back to the idea of friendship and even uh, the Greek idea of xenia or hospitality, from the moment we encounter Philoctetes, and uh, I thought uh, Tom did a great job of bringing this out, uh, Philoctetes is this uh, miraculously warm and hospitable character, right? I mean, here's a guy who's been on this island for all this time. He's been suffering. And the first thing he's asking is about uh, Neoptolemus. How are you? What's your backstory? And tell me about, you know, the other mem members of our uh, social network. How are they doing? So he, he quickly goes from being this, you know, isolated, outsider, outcast, disgusting figure to, you know, the, the most human uh, character in the play, arguably, and certainly the representative of our humanity. So uh, I, I would say all of that is uh, tremendously relevant to us. And tragically, it may become even more relevant as time goes on and uh, humans face even more pressures to dehumanize one another, sadly. So, uh, yeah, as we mentioned last week, you know, the, and as Jack just put on the um, chat, there's this threat that being isolated and separate from, from each other strips us of what makes us most human, which is our communities and our abilities to engage with it. And there's, you know, there's real scientific literature that's been done looking at people in solitary confinement and the impact that it has on their neurobiology. Right. Over time, if you're if you're deprived of human contact, engagement with language and emotions, you actually lose the ability to function uh, or use high, you lose higher level mental and emotional functions and you go towards madness more steadily. And this has a neurobiological component to it. There are fewer connections being made in synapses and over time um, it can get much worse. Um, now, uh, uh, Everyone has been involved in this project, so several of you are the second week are in the second week. Do you have any questions about the play or ideas that occurred to you while preparing for it, um, or, or as part of this experience or another? I mean, it's a challenging play that we're making really modern, but there are some parts of it that aren't. So I'd love to hear some more questions. I, uh, I had one thing, um, something we talked about last week. This is Lana, by the way. One thing we talked about last week was this, again, being in the boxes and not being able to, to touch each other. And, um, and, I, and again, that, that's come up in our discussion already. Um, there's that one moment when Philoctetes is in that horrible pain and he's moaning and Neoptolemus is, is trying to offer help, but it's, kind of, it's a very helpless situation. And the fact that you weren't together at that point, that, that compounded that. Um, I know personally that's something I'm dealing, dealing with in my own family. If you have a, an, an, a parent who's not well and you can't get to them because everyone's locked down. And if, if anything else goes wrong, how do you deal with that right now? Um, and how to offer support when you can't be there. Um, so I thought that that speaks beautifully both to what's happening in the play and our current situation right now. Yeah, Lana, can I say something about that? Sure. 
Yeah, so I, I think that's a, a great observation. And uh, I, th I think the play, the, the, the example you use there um, really uh, elicits this. And also e even, even more narrowly, the use of the right hand in the play. Uh, and and this, this came out in, in both uh, or in, in all of the readings that the right hand is both the thing that you can use to uh, draw your weapon which is obviously to signal a hostile intent. You know, putting your hand on a gun or putting your hand on a weapon is one of the most basic ways you can signal to somebody, you are my enemy. Uh, by the same token, the right hand, as uh, Neoptolemus uses it when he's uh, swearing his oath to Philoctetes, is the, uh, the gesture you use to ensure trust. And, you know, we're, we're now, I, I was just thinking instinctively, I shook a man's hand two days ago, just because we were talking and I just wanted to be like, hey, shake your hand. And then five minutes later, I was kicking myself because I thought, oh my gosh, did, did I give him coronavirus or did he give it uh, to me? And, and to not be able to reinforce those basic bonds of trust right now, I think it can be very anxiety producing. And, and you know, th these are thousand year old uh, ways that human beings have of just saying, I trust you. I, I have good intentions toward you. Like, uh, and you mentioned in the chat, uh, Lana, about wearing masks. Like the face is another one of the ways that we reassure each other. Uh, a smile, right, is the most basic way you say, like, I am trustworthy. Like, come to me. You know, I am welcoming. And if you've got a mask on, like, yeah, I think uh, it can be really hard. I think, um, and I thank you for bringing up that scene where Philoctetes um, is in pain and Neoptolemus doesn't know what to do. Um, I think that. You know, some of us are good at showing empathy and comforting people in pain, and some of us aren't. And I can't quite tell what that is. But I think there's something uh, metapoetic about Philoctetes' experiences, because at its core, um, we feel pain alone. We feel it isolated. And even if we're filled with, a, we're surrounded by people, when we're beset by pain, there's no way of knowing if anybody else can really understand what we're experiencing. And I think part of the riddle of the play, but also its power comes in the beginning when Odysseus, uh, when the narrator says that they're gonna cheat the mind of Philoctetes um, by means of a story. And I mean, this is the story language. This is the only way we can convey information anyways. I mean, we have the physical gesture that allows us to communicate, um, but stories allow us to take what's in here or the experiences of our pain and give them to somebody else. So the flip side, to go to a comment that came from a viewer, is this remarkable thing that happens when Philoctetes just trusts Neoptolemus, that he decides he's going to give him the bow, and Neoptolemus is shocked. He's like, wait, it wasn't supposed to be that easy. Right? And so there's this real fascinating thing about the play, I think is a good reminder for all of us, and that's that the person who's presented at the beginning as being the least human, the least desirable, is the one with the greatest amount of empathy, right? Um, and that tells us something about where we should be looking for what it means to be human. Um, so there's one question to look at. I, I think I know the answer to this, but Norman, check me on this. Um, the ancient Greeks did shake hands, right? I mean, they more shook arms. Uh, no, my understanding is it's a, uh, the, the, the hands. Uh, you, you see a lot of, um, on funerary monuments, there, there's an a actual uh, term, dexiosis, the, mm -hmm. the presentation of the right hand. Uh, and, and there, it's, it's when someone is dying. And I think it's a, it's a gesture of farewell, like a final hand clasp as someone is dying. But you also, I, I don't know that they were going around high-fiving each other on a regular basis or just shaking hands, uh, you know, as we might do. But certainly in the forming of oaths, uh, it, 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 there's there's a, a couple plays um, like like the Philoctetes, but also uh, in Aeschylus's Agamemnon, where there is this interesting play um, between the the hand as an oath maker and a ha the hand as a weapon handler, like uh, Clytemnestra when she's uh, when she's murdered Agamemnon, she says, you know, I did it with this right hand, and she's calling to mind the fact that that would have been the hand that she gave uh, in marriage. So, so yes, as uh, I, I would say, uh, certainly in a, in a more formalized, ritualized sense, I don't really know, I, I can't think of an example of it being as casual 
uh, as like saying hello, but it's perfectly plausible to me that that was uh, what went on too. Good question. So uh, as we um, wrap up, um, I'd like to go around um, and talk to each, uh, all the participants just briefly, what's something you got out of this and what's something you might add to this process in the future as we do um, uh, a couple more plays. So Tim and Evelyn, you're in the same frame. So we'll, we'll start with you. Yeah, it was, I mean, that was really fascinating what you, the, the conversation about dehumanization, uh, especially, you know, in relation to illness and the discussions, like you say, that are happening in the States, but also to some degree over here, you know, whether we just let old and vulnerable people die to keep the economy going. Um, it, it's just really fascinating and fascinating to see, you know, as with last week, that that discussion and those ideas are far from new. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I think this is um, the first reading that I've done with you guys. I, it, it's really been brilliant, actually, and fascinating reading a Greek text, a Greek tragedy that has so much to say about the current uh, situation that we're in and, and all of these relevances that you've been talking about. Because I mean, I, I think with the shutdown of theatres in the UK and across the world, I've certainly been thinking in the last few, last few days, last few weeks, sort of what stories, how stories suddenly, the, the, a lot of stories seem very irrelevant suddenly um, coming out of this. And, and this is such a, the coronavirus story, the, the, the crisis is, is such a huge thing, it seems. It's, it feels like the, the stories we tell in theatre are going to need to reflect it. I, I, and I, and, but it's fascinating that this Greek tragedy that I didn't know previously actually is, is so relevant. And it, it kind of just goes to show how brilliant they are at talking to us, they kind of just keep on being relevant. I, I think that's what was just so exciting about discovering this. Yeah, I mean, what, whose stories we tell matter, right? And, you know, the period matters as well. So I, I, think, I think you're right. We're, we're going to be telling different stories for a long time. Um, Jack, what did you see from this? Um, and what would you like to do in the future with it? I, um, this, this is, as I said before, this is the first time that I've um, done something like this. Um, and even just seeing the simple things like Tim and Evie um, doing this sort of switch um, and, and ending up in the same room, the simple lighting. I'd be interested to look at the, the sort of the, the mise-en-scene of the box that we're in and how you can use that to tell the story clearer, but simply as well. You know, I was thinking about sort of distance proximity of, of how you could make things appear bigger than what they are, um, uh, how you can use distance, um, the lighting, the direction of it. And, you know, there's a difference between sort of talking like this and then looking directly into the camera and, and using that. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's throw, theatrically, it throws up lots of opportunities. Just, I think you think outside the box or think inside the box, as it were. Terrible jokes. Look at that <laughs> but it's, um, it's really interesting because this is, I mean, this is going to go on for an unknown period of time. And uh, we're going to have to get used to this sort of thing but also what could be really nice is that out of um out of the constraints that human beings are given sometimes new things are created um you know if you're asked to write a poem you say okay i'll write a poem but if it's if you have to write a sonnet about love suddenly you're given the parameters with which you should play it in and then you you become more creative i think so maybe something will come from human beings need for to see live pieces you know there's a big difference between us doing this live now and a pre-recording of it because you know anything could happen there's the danger involved and and it's all very it, it gives me hope and it's lovely to look other people in the face and and uh and, and to chat to people that aren't in very close proximity I, I like the way you took us from thinking inside a box to a love sonnet 
All right, there's a little bit of magic in that un unscripted routine there. <laughs> I'm hoping it won't be as long as we suspect. Maybe we will get our own Heracles to come in and, and show us a different way. Paul, can you talk a little bit about um, the differences between this time and, and, and last performance? Well, I, th I thought it was, it was um, it, it picked up on something that Jack just said. It's really exciting to start to kind of play with what you can do with this form like even in starting now in kind of quite small ways I feel like we're just scratching the surface now of what we can kind of start to, to try to do and I'm really excited to see then how this continues to develop I see this as you know this is kind of part of a process basically isn't it of sort of just just learning new ways in which to to communicate and tell these stories and and reimagine these stories so that felt that felt really exciting um this week and, and one other thing I just wanted to kind of pick up on really briefly is how much I enjoyed that first scene and, and sort of just that, that idea of someone just coaching someone like that, of going, kind of, okay, this is what's going to happen. This is what, you, this is what you're going to do. They're, they're going to say this and then you pick up on that. And it, it, it put me in mind of, of Hamlet with the players um, quite a bit um, and about sort of just sort of like letting someone kind of like showing the technique of what you're going to then have to do. Yeah, there's definitely something very meta theatrical about those engagements um, mm. that Sophocles I don't think always gets recognized for. Um, Norman you had very little warning or explanation about what we were doing. What was it like for you coming in um, to this experience? And you're still muted my friend. Sorry thank you. I, I know I thoroughly enjoyed it uh, and thank you so much for uh, including me in this and and I think Jack has pretty much already said what I was going to say um, maybe I would just add that you know I, I think um, you know being isolated um, being uncertain about the future being uncertain about uh, the timeline of the future um, despite our leaders attempts to impose one on the future I think all of that can be a very depressing thing and uh, as we all know uh, depression tends to sap creativity uh, and tends to sap our ability to make meaning out of life. And I, I'm just, I'm warmed uh, and inspired by the fact that uh, e even under non-ideal circumstances, we still see uh, lovely people here uh, being creative, taking chances, experimenting. And if this is the new normal, uh, I think it could still be really exciting. Uh, it's gonna be way better than the Brady Bunch, uh, I can tell you, uh, even though it kind of looks like that uh, right now, it's gonna be way more uh, creative and interesting than that. See, I keep thinking Hollywood Squares when I look at the screen. Um, that would be fun, yeah, to play in character. Um, before we close up shop, um, those of you who've been with us, Janet, Ellen. Uh, Sarah, Lana, Keith, would you like to add anything to the discussion? All right, Janet. Uh, this week, I did not read the uh, lines with you. Uh, and I was hanging every word you were uttering. And that made me feel I am really watching a play. And um, it was excellent. I really enjoyed it. And uh, when Tim and Evelyn came together. That was, wow, this is really, a, uh, I am really watching this and I really, really enjoyed it. And Jack, you were awesome. Really, uh, you set the tone for the play. And Paul, thank you. Thank you so much for coming up with this idea. And I, I am so happy that this is going to stay and, uh, will be watched after you know we get out and this is going to be so accessible to someone who cannot uh, go to a theater and hopefully and uh, we are going to come and watch you in person one day that there is hope so we'll we'll continue thank you yes okay so Ella? i just yeah, I just want to add something. Well, it was splendid, so thank you all. It was really great. And I just wanted to uh, say that in the play itself, you have hope because uh, Philoctetus is going to be cured. And he's got, you know, so we have hope right in the play. So let's keep 
hoping that everything will end well. And thank you again. So next week, we'll be wrapping up or starting at the same time at three o'clock Eastern Standard Time. We'll be starting where we stopped in a way. Uh, we'll be doing Heracles by Euripides um, with a guest from Anne's, uh, guest appearance from Anne Sophie Noel. I don't want to close without thanking the Center for Hellenic Studies and Cosmos Society, um, Sarah, Keith, Lana, making this happen, Paul for being the idea man, um, and everybody who watches this in the future. Thank you and be safe.